last couple of hours, we've had some very interesting sessions. Um, they've covered a range of topics from how to use existing data and evidence for policy making to boosting the role of women in rural areas. So in a moment, I'm going to introduce our uh, three, I'll be calling them up one by one, rapporteurs who followed two sessions each. In the meantime, I'd like to introduce and welcome on stage our three panelists who are going to give us some feedback following the rapporteurs. They are Michael Schmitz from the Council of European Municipalities and Regions, Ben Van Essen from the European Rural Community Alliance, and finally, a welcome to Hilke Verheinen from the Natural Resources Institute. So before I ask our panelists for their reaction, we're going to hear now from our rapporteurs. And I'd first like to invite on stage Betty Ann Bryce from the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, the OECD. Betty, you're very welcome. Uh, do you need, if you need a slide mover, there it is. That'll move it forward for you. Um, hello, everyone. Um, happy to be here. Appreciate the um, invitation. I will be useful with my time and go right to the slides. We had a really interesting discussion. Um, the data and evidence um, session was complicated to uh, bring just to four points or five points. So, I mean, I, I cheated a bit and added a few. But the idea here is that more granularity is needed. I think that was the biggest message that emerged from that conversation. There was some examples provided of 78 indicators being available in one of the presentations, but only 11 could be attributed to like the lower, the lower level. So that was just an example of why there was this push and pull in the conversation between we have too much data and not enough. And that 78 versus 11 gives you a sense of what that is. It's really about granularity and breaking it down so that you're getting information that you need. There was also some discussion about local design and lo having that local level be more engaged in how it's designed, the collection, to ensure that it's in sync with local needs. There was some conversation about maybe some mismatch between what's collected and what's there and how it's used. So in the idea is if you bring in that bottom up approach to it and introduce that you might get some more um, leveling off of that information. Thinking about new ways to deliver and report data to not miss learnings. There was some discussion about this opportunity about the way that they have to report back. You might not be able to catch the successes. You're missing great things that are happening because if the report back systems or the data is too formulaic, some of these beautiful stories are not being captured and, and they're out there to look for you to learn from and you're missing those. So how do you become a bit more innovative in what you do? Um, Focusing on indicators is just not enough. That was a message that was there. It really is about the indicators plus what is happening at the local level. So again, that voice comes up again and how do, who do you learn from? And are you having those uh, matching what you think you know with what you don't know to get to where you should be going? And finally, it's about um, improving that data to support effective implementation of territorial impact assessments but also rural proofing needs a certain type of data to ensure that it works so there was always a lot of tension around rural proofing not really working well not being successful i won't go off on that you can call me later but the point is that no matter what rural proofing has to be supported by nuanced data and we need to understand what that data is that you need to support it to make the case for what you need it for and that is no longer that doesn't exist and also to ensure that you have effective implementation of your territorial impact assessments, you also need to have more nuanced data. So that's all in a nutshell. Um, thank you. Um, okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Betty Ann. And now our next rapporteur. Yeah, I, did you? No, so did you also cover harnessing rural talent? So if you, yeah, you, you should do that as well, yeah. Thank you. Um, so for harnessing rural talent, that was really, really a great session. We heard from everything there was all examples. So big message, not just job creation, quality of jobs. That is um, 
That's, that's what we need. We don't need, they, young people don't just need jobs, they need quality jobs, they need them to be more diverse, they need them to be more flexible. Great example, Campus Rural Spain, I hope, Campus Rural, I hope I'm saying that correctly. That happens in Spain, it's a, I mean, if you don't know anything about it, please contact them to learn more. Um, and the voucher system in Ireland, which allows for more remote working from home, bring young people to the table. It's, it's really important that you hear their voice, you empower them, give them opportunity to design the strategies and to be a part of it so that they feel more connected to where they are and build the capacity of decision makers to represent young people. That's very important. And Luxembourg has a great example of how they're having young people train decision makers on how to represent them. Okay, brilliant, Patty Ann, thanks very much for that. So our next rapporteur is Maura Farrell from Galway University in Ireland. Maura is going to report on the two sessions she followed, strengthening rural areas contribution to food systems and the bioeconomy and boosting women's role in rural areas. Maura, you're very welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And uh, I stuck fairly well to the three points because people in Ireland do exactly as they're told. So uh, I stuck fairly well to that. Uh, and the uh, so my first session was strengthening rural areas contribution to food systems and the bioeconomy. So the key areas that we looked at around this and again, um, no more than Betty Ann, super interesting ideas, wonderful examples, wonderful talks. The first key kind of approach that we felt for policy was that the need for to boost territorial approaches and we need to do this i suppose to enhance the basic services and the infrastructures including everything from access to land to education training roadworks we could go on a list a mile long in doing this in boosting these territorial approaches we really can positively impact the depopulation that we've talked about all morning, the idea of enhancing investment, innovation, and the broader rural development and sustainability. All of this can be done via boosting territorial approaches. The second ask, ask, aspect that we focused quite a lot on was ensuring social return on investment. And really, we need to create the conditions and the correct criteria around the funding. And we need to be able to also accept and select those for funding to ensure, I suppose, that value chains and the financial gain comes very much to the rural area itself. And we spoke quite a lot from two very good examples in our area, particularly from Portugal, who talked quite a lot about the value chain adding to the value that was being exported out of that rural area and mountainous areas in particular not having the value of what was happening. So ensuring social return on investment was something we felt was imperative. Enhancing local capacity of rural people as well. This was a huge conversation in a lot of the groups that we broke into. And this is really to consider the local bottom up development. And this can be achieved really through skills and training around project development and access to funding. There are a lot of people in rural areas that really cannot get off the starting point because they don't have this training or these skills. A good idea around this was to deliver a lot of this skills training and skills and a funding investment via a one-stop shop model. So I suppose that's what we had within strengthening rural areas contribution to food systems and to the bioeconomy. The second aspect that we looked at was boosting women's rural role in rural areas. And again, I suppose a, a topic very close to my own heart. I'm uh, leading one of the funded um, European projects, Horizon projects at the moment, the Falara project. And we had a wonderful example from the Grass Ceiling project and Sally Shortall within this session. A session that was really well, uh, I suppose, attended and really some people have really become ignited in their interest and their passion in and around this topic, my own included. Strengthening the data collection around women in rural areas is our absolute starting point in and around this topic. At national and at EU level, we need to be able to provide a picture for gender proofing in policy and in rural areas. If we don't have the data, then we cannot make the changes. And that's what really came forward in everybody's conversation. 
We need to reduce the gender inequalities in rural areas and boost women's opportunities for employment and for innovation. And we feel that this really can be improved if we provide the skills and the services that are required for women within rural areas. One of the key aspects that is holding back women in rural areas is access to finance, access to investors that women spoke about as well in the in this session. Tailor made training, women can require different type of training at different stages of innovation, and we need to make sure that the training is provided for them. Access to childcare is a huge stopgap when it comes to boosting women's innovation in rural areas, as is access to, uh, I suppose, care for the elderly as well, which often falls in relation to women in rural areas. Improved healthcare was also something that can be a, a key stopgap when we're trying to boost women's innovation levels in rural areas. The final point that we had here was ensuring women's engagement at decision making levels. It's not new to any of us that uh, the decision making levels can be quite male dominated. We need to try and change this. We can change this by changing the gender narrative and we can do this as well by empowering women and if we bring together the super examples that I suppose we are in the projects that are currently been funded by the Horizon projects that we're trying to bring forward these examples. If we can highlight and spotlight these examples, then we can start to change the narrative. We can start to see that there is a huge amount of women out there that are already empowered in innovative positions. We also need to make sure that we start to look at ensuring that a certain percentage of women are in the decision making positions and bodies at local, national and at EU level. So Shina Will, that's me. Thank you very much, Maura. Thank you. Thank you, Maura. And our final rapporteur is Serafin Pazos uh, from the European Association for Innovation in Local Development. Serafin is going to tell us about the session on paving the way to the digital era and enabling community-led innovation and smart villages. Serafin. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I, um, I don't want to take you much away from the final conclusion, so I will try to be brief and sharp. We were asked, uh, to use this exercise as a way of, if you could actually help draft the council recommendations that will come in November, what would be the specific recommendations? And that's the focus we gave to our two sessions. Uh, the first session paved the way to the digital era. We obviously discussed the big gap even in the evidence about how close we are to having a full digital uh, society, particularly in rural areas, and the big difference in gaps uh, about coverage that exist even in official uh, uh, sources of information. We also discussed capacity and how crucial infrastructure is uh, to ensure uh, digital connectivity across, uh, across Europe, in particular rural areas. So that's the general reflection. In terms of particular uh, recommendations, we even tried to even come up with some slightly catchy, some people would say cheesy, but anyway, uh, slogans or to, to try to drive some ideas and ho hopefully make some of them into the council uh, conclusions. The first one is make gigabyte connectivity a right. Um, territorial cohesion is a right, at least many of us believe that, and that should also improve, involve digital uh, connectivity. Uh, digital infrastructure should be future-proofed, so we don't basically not trap from present technologies that in two, year, two, two, two years, ten years are completely obsolete. So there has to be a, a proper future-proofing of uh, digital technologies because basic services are a right. They are in the treaties, they are in our national constitutions, they are in the Charter of Fundamental Rights, they are in the social pillar. Digital connectivity is, we believe, one of them. Uh, and basic services, it's important also to say, uh, they cannot always be done uh, with digital services. Digital services are to help basic services, not to replace them. It is good to have telemedicine, for instance, but you know, I think we all prefer to have a, a doctor nearby. Uh, I think a hybrid model, uh, or we believe it will be uh, the reasonable one. There should be a collective rollout, could be a national, nationwide, region-wide, groups of municipalities, rollout of digital infrastructure. Shared services, why we need to have different institutions having the same different uh, digital infrastructure when you have a single one that can be shared, both the costs and the risks uh, between the different administrations. Public procurement innovation should be part of that, not just procuring what exists, but actually doing 
a much more sophisticated way of doing power procurement. That will also drive create market, but also drive innovation and boost demand. Uh, make children as agents for change. Uh, digital inclusion should start from the early ages and therefore uh, to achieve a cultural change that also can introduce social innovation, uh, the younger generations are should be the particular focus and they should start for, from schools. That doesn't mean you should only focus on youth. Uh, there should be digital inclusion for all ages. And uh, schools, as I say, is just the, the first gateway of a journey of uh, training. Should involve lags uh, and should also involve uh, the social impact of digital investments because digital technologies can be useful, but you know, when you actually make them in contact with reality, uh, you know, you need to understand the social consequences of that. As we and some of the other speakers said already, rural proofing, in this case, rural digital proofing is uh, quite uh, relevant. And something that we have heard again today, we need better coordination between the specialized technical departments, ministries, and uh, rural ministries, uh, department in charge of rural development. Uh, in regards to session five, uh, which is uh, enabling communities, community led innovation in smart villages. So this, this slide, yeah, there you are. Very easy, very clear, even. We're trying to uh, look at community led innovation in smart villages. Uh, one thing that came up very clearly, we need to actually do capacity building, more and better capacity building to enhance social capital. This is something that cannot be allowed just the local authorities left to themselves or the local communities. We need to also do easy money, provide easy money for difficult things, which is a catchy way, I would hope, to say we need to actually have EU funding rules or national funding rules that foster the appetite for risk and don't penalize failure, allow for mistakes. Equally, we shouldn't be evaluating just on qualitative, quantitative terms. We should all evaluate in qualitative terms and allow knowledge transfer and creating structures that allows a replication of knowledge. Crucially, we need to focus on local capacity. And we are basically proposing a local capacity building support action, which is essentially a one-stop shop when you can actually provide technical assistance for those community groups that would like to do uh, digital and social innovation. And that will also include as a part of the package, uh, supporting and creating innovation brokers to help uh, the, those communities and groups that are further away from the innovation journey to get into that track. And I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Very good. Thank you. Okay, so um, we're now going to get just some brief uh, recommendations, feedback from our three panelists. Please do continue to answer the Slido question um, during the segment as well, and then Enrique will give us a sort of a summary of what has uh, what have been the main points from that. Uh, let me reintroduce our panelists again. Michael Schmitz is from the Council of European Municipalities and Regions. Ben van Essen is from the European Rural Community Alliance, and finally Hilke Beheinen is from the Natural Resources Institute in Finland. I'm just going to put one question, which has kind of got two parts. Um, so, Michael, if I start off with you, from your point of view, what do you think are the main conclusions and takeaways from today's forum that you'd like to highlight? And I suppose the ones that in particular affect the, the stakeholders, the actors you would be involved in. Thank you very much. First of all, uh, thank you for the opportunity to just give a brief, few brief remarks. Uh, and for those of you who don't know, CMR is a local government association that represents roughly 100,000 local and regional governments in uh, Europe, uh, beyond the EU, by the way. Um, so my main takeaways are, it's, first of all, it's good that we meet. First of all, it's good that we agree that rural areas are important. That's the first thing. The second part, which is probably not that easy, is we now need to act. We now need to go into the concrete implementation. We now need to talk about how we can really, really help rural areas. And I'm just uh, looking at the future of, of funding. I can tell you EAFRD, the money is not going to get more. Um, cohesion policy, I have to say, is uh, in some part, and I can give concrete examples, targeting more urban areas um, and not as much rural areas as it could. Um, and we're actually lacking structural policies specifically targeting rural areas. We need help for municipalities, and we need in particular help for small municipalities to overcome all the challenges that they're facing. And one of those, and I'll also give you a very brief example, is 
inflation because municipalities and small municipalities, which I consider rural, by the way, I don't think there should be a distinction being made. I don't know if you would consider Siguenza urban or rural. Uh, if Siguenza, by the way, had 600 inhabitants more, according to the De Gorba definition, it would be considered intermediate and no longer rural. I would still consider this rural. rural. Yeah. And um, why not, you know, enhance the capacity of municipalities such as Siguenza to provide public transport, to, to apply for funds, to really, really provide all the infrastructure that people need. And I don't really see that there's a clear focus in EU policy to achieve that. And that is something that I take away from this, that this is urgently needed. Okay, thank you for that, Michael. Ben, let's go to you. Thank you. Main conclusions and takeaways, particularly from the perspective of the stakeholders you represent. Well, uh, let me uh, uh, start with one takeaway we also should make, I think, that this, is, this was a, a very fine meeting, well organized and uh, very inspiring. So I, I think we should start with that as a, as a, uh, as a conclusion. Um, when I think about, let me also make a general remark. It's only two years ago that the long-term vision was, uh, was put in place by the European Commission. Two years. I know in Europe, uh, two years is very long, but when you look at where we stand now, um, 30 actions from the action plan are in place. And um, to, in this morning, we heard uh, what was what's happening in the cap and the cohesion policy. So if we look what is to have, what is, has to be done, don't let's, let's not forget, uh, count our blessings, uh, look at where we stand. And I think um, that's an important thing to, to, to keep up now. But uh, really, there is, um, we should build on that. So there is a lot to do. It's, it, we're not ready, I think. And uh, what there is to do, I, I would want to make two points. On the one hand, um, I um, think our Commissioner Wojciechowski has um, made his point, and he said we should maximize results. We should show results. So that's the first uh, thing to do. But the second thing, thing to do is also um, that we have, a, like uh, Mrs. Uh, Cavella said, we have an, op uh, an a, a, a opportunity to make this long-term vision a, a, a basis in a true rural strategy. So that would be a long-term thing to do. So on the one hand, uh, is, uh, we should work today, but on the other hand, we also should look to the future what um, concerns the first point, I think there's a lot to do. Uh, I will not uh, uh, take everything in, 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 in place now, but for instance, uh, Radim Sorsen, he uh, mentioned that uh, there are a lot of tools, we don't use them. Mm -hmm. So uh, maximize results would also be, be uh, use what, what, what is there. And the second thing, I would like to state something about the Rural Community Alliance. Um, I think we have a unique selling point that we are in 16, 16 countries, 16 Euro, European countries. We are really present on the grassroots movement and in all these villages. For instance, in my country, 4,000 villages. And all, in all these villages, rural people are working on quality of life and they, they are trying to make the best of their village. And now what we want to do is, as ERCA, is be some kind of an elevator organization to bind all these local groups to the Euro rural pact. That's why we uh, have now a survey under, amongst our, our members to ask, uh, what do you do with this rural pact and what can we do? And on uh, November 22, we will we'll have a web event with our members to, to discuss this point because we think we can contribute um, to this rural pact, making it a, a, a success. And there's, there's a lot of work to do. So that would be the two points to, um, in concerning uh, maximize the result. One last thing uh, about the future. Um, I think there, is a new, there are elections, there will be a new commission, and the challenges for Europe will be immense. It will, will be very big. So it's not only, so it's not 
um, uh, obvious that rural development will be on top of the list. So it has a lot of work to do. And this is what we all should do. And let me take in account a little point. Um, the Netherlands is perhaps the less rural country of uh, Europe. But we had gen uh, regional elections half a year ago. And what you saw there is when you neglect rural uh, regions, it's, it, it's a big throwback in politics. And people say, no, that's not the way we do it. So my advice would be um, to work on a real, really rural strategy for the next period. And for me, that is a commitment for all of us. We are the people to do that. Okay, Ben, thank you very much. Very comprehensive as well. And I think, <laughs> yeah. Somebody earlier this morning, one of the panel debates, I can't remember which one, but they made the same point about the elections. And I think that what happened in, in certain areas, the Eurosceptics, you know, more right-wing uh, populist parties will gain ground in the rural areas. So you, you can't switch off from that. And I think the other interesting point about the change of commission is we know a new, new set of commissioners can bring with them a whole new set of political or, or ambitions which can change things. So very challenging to keep rural, the rural agenda high up on the EU agenda. So maybe Hilke Verheinen, from a Finnish point of view, you're, you represent the Natural Resources Institute. You can give us your takeaways, recommendations, conclusions. Mm -hmm. Yes, my uh, takeaways are for, for the academia, uh, for us researchers. Um, on top of my mind um, is the fact uh, that um, as to the rural pact, uh, we all, um, all uh, actors in, uh, in rural um, issues, be they uh, politicians or uh, civil servants or uh, local activists or us researchers, we form a chain. And with this chain, we will get things done. But if we function in isolation, uh, we won't get much done. Uh, so I would like to um, encourage my uh, colleagues, researchers, and also remind myself about the importance to, um, to collaborate closely with decision makers, decision takers, um, to help them structure complicated phenomena, uh, provide them, of course, with data and facts. Uh, but also, on top of that, it's important to um, offer interpretations on, of what these um, things really mean in, in rural areas. Um, we need uh, evidence, uh, we need more impact assessment, and, and tools for doing these assessments and evaluations. Um, uh, we need kinds of um, interfaces to co-construct this evidence. Um, for example, in, in the Sherpa and Granula uh, projects, these have been, uh, have been developed. Uh, we need these also because in the end, uh, policy and politics is about timing. So we should also be uh, better in recognizing the windows of opportunity. So where do we put the effort? Where we, do we put it as, as researchers and, and as, as uh, uh, people who implement the policies and, and politicians who, who will take the, the decisions? Uh, so this is, this is the first thing. Uh, encourage us researchers to be a stronger part of the chain. And, and also put us uh, to, uh, out, out of our comfort zones and work with the politicians. The second thing is, is a very old challenge um, as to rural policy, uh, but, but I'm afraid it's, it's still very urgent. And it has to do with, um, with understanding how integrated whole of government policy works. Uh, we've had it about how we need, uh, how we uh, have to have holistic policies for rural areas. But in order to make them uh, um, 
effective, uh, we need to understand how, how do you, what kind of uh, platforms, what kind of policy tools, what kind of, of, uh, um, of data and ways of, of collecting data and interpreting data we need. Uh, and here, I think that as we researchers should, um, should do more comparative studies uh, and, and also um, we need more policy benchmarking analysis uh, so that we would understand the whole of government um, uh, phenomenon much better in the rural context. Um, my, my last uh, point um, has to do with the evolving policies. Uh, we heard in the morning uh, that there are many challenges uh, within the Commission and within the, the policy fields. Um, and now, already now, uh, plans uh, for, the, for the coming programming period are on the way. Um, we may envisage changes uh, and uh, we have to be very well be prepared for them in the rural areas, irrespective of what they will be. Uh, we have to bear in mind that all divisions of labor are also divisions of power. So when we shift policies, when we shift focus, when we choose new uh, measures, we should uh, be very uh, transparent as to how they affect different regions, different countries in the EU, uh, different groups of people in rural areas, also urban areas. Um, and, and also different lines of businesses. So it, it, there may be things that, uh, that we don't all like, but we will be much better off the better we prepare ourselves with, with data, with, um, with facts and with uh, interpretations and impact analysis. Okay, thank you very much, Hilke. So, um...